Good morning. I'm delighted today to be chatting to Dr. Hilary Cook. Um, for those of you that don't know you, Hilary, please tell me a little bit about yourself and also about Merlin. Thanks, Mary. Well, my background is hotels, was always hotels and human resources in hotels. Um, and then probably 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, um, I left corporate life to start as a self-employed or um, freelance trainer. So Merlin now has grown from that aspiration and we provide um, learning and development and business development solutions to mainly hospitality businesses, not only, but mainly hospitality businesses. And my heart's in hospitality, so that's what I love. Well, it's a, it's a fantastic industry to be in, isn't it? it I, is. um, to sort of get the ball rolling, I mean, 2020 has been such a challenging year, especially for the hospitality sector. We're in a transition phase at the moment. So we're sort of moving away from lockdown and back into a, a sort of a new way of doing business. You've recently written a fantastic ebook, which I have to say I loved, called Picking Up the Pieces. What inspired you to write it? And um, who are picking up the pieces, oops, sorry, picking up the pieces target audience? Okay, I was inspired to write it because at the time of lockdown, there was a lot about um, a lot of content about keeping remote teams going. And it didn't really hit the spot for me because a lot of hospitality teams had been disbanded and didn't have a purpose. They weren't doing anything. Those people were furloughed and at home not doing anything, while other people were in the business keeping it going and probably never having worked harder. So you got this very um, distinct difference between the, between the people working. So I could see this as a challenge for coming back. What happens when we bring those people back into one team, those that have been working really hard through furlough and those of you that haven't? It's 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 not a judgment thing, it's a factual thing, and that makes it challenging to get a team back together. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I loved about the book, you mentioned Kintsugi. I hope I pronounced that right. It's yeah. a Japanese form of um, Zen aesthetics um, that creates beautiful things from broken things. Um, and it's in the book. What's the relevance? What can people learn from this? Well, that terrible week after um, we were all told not to go to pubs, but there was no relief, so we couldn't claim on insurance because we've been told to close them. There was a lot of anxiety and um, worry um, about the future. And the one phrase that kept us all going, any operators that I spoke to, was we will come back and we will come back stronger. And I think that's true for businesses. I think that's true for the industry. And I also think it's true for individuals. So much has changed that the only way of getting through this is to make sure that we do come back stronger. So I love this metaphor of Kintsugi because it is literally when a pot or a glass gets broken, the art form is to mend it, but using gold and resin and precious metals so that the cracks show, but the, the, the finished product is even more um, valuable and um, beautiful and stronger than it was before. So it's a Hello. great metaphor. It is a great metaphor for hospitality people, isn't it? Because we're bringing them back. They're facing lots of new challenges, but they are coming back bigger, better, stronger and more beautiful, I think. Um, one of the things that struck me about your book was you talk about leaving the void. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, the void, leaving the void is part of the transition process. So in moving businesses to change or moving people to change, you only really get change once the transition process has been finished and completed. And the void is the middle bit. So in order to change, in order to, to transition, we have to let go of something. And in letting go of something, there's a sadness and anxiety. And then eventually, because we don't like staying in that situation, we need to move forward and, and look at new beginnings. And I like to use new beginning as a term instead of new normal, because I don't think we've really been through all this just in um just about reaching a new normal. There's nothing normal about it. It's completely different. The way that we do business, the way that we um, go about doing things is different and it will be different. It'll stay different. So it's a new beginning. So t sort of picking up what you've just said, leaders at the moment, you know, team leaders, managers, etc. within hospitality, they are, are they in the void at the moment or have they transitioned out and they've left behind what happened during lockdown? Where do you feel they are? Oh, gosh, I don't know. That's a that's a wide question. And I guess everyone is in different positions because everyone um, transitions in their own way. 
I think it's also a useful model to use if you're needing to make people redundant because redundancy is a transition process. First of all, very disappointed, needing to let go, um, you know, anxiety, and then finding something else and recreating a career. So it works on an individual basis. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I think the leadership bit is the part that's necessary about creating a new beginning. And the challenge for hospitality managers and leaders all the time is the operational demands on them as managers and the limited time there is left to think as a leader. That's really why I wrote, wrote the book. Yeah, well, I, exactly. I mean, I completely agree with all of that. One of the things that I, I've been watching and I've obviously I've interviewed a few people recently, the switch from furlough to full steam ahead has been really rapid. And the operational has kind of taken over from that. We had a very holistic approach during lockdown. Looking at the operational side and the welfare of hospitality people, do you think leaders have time to take a step back and strategize? And why should they? OK, that's a really good question, because probably the answer is no, they don't, um, because it's full steam ahead, as you, as you say. So I think there's a lot in, in your question. Um, I think it is important to strategize because strategy is the link between objective and tactics. So operational stuff is very tactical at the moment. There's very defined ways of doing things. Um, and the objective needs to create some sort of sense of purpose for people. Otherwise, it's an objective of just, I don't know, staying safe, staying alive, staying in business. And that doesn't really engage people. That's a necessity. It's not a motivator. So I think this taking time to create a leadership strategy because things have changed. The way that we lead in hospitality businesses has been forced to change because of the blurring of people's personal lives. Some people will have bounced back readily, hungrily after being furloughed because they can't wait to get back to work. And other people have different levels of anxiety about what they're leaving behind. So it's really complex. And for the first time, really, we have to get engaged with what our colleagues' personal situations are and be more emotionally available as leaders. All at a time when we've never been busier op operationally, it's hard work in the operation because everything's being done differently. So it's hard to find the time, but I think it really is important to, to find the time and that's kind of why I put the book together, because it's a bit of a toolkit to shortcut some of the um, time that you might need to spend to do that. It's really, and I've tried to make it fun into a bit of a game, that it's not hard work. Yeah, I, exactly. I was just, my next point was about the book, about the leadership game. You, you use that the concept, it's a very, uh, and the concept of a cube. It's a very fa powerful one, and, you know, with each face represents a different stage of moving forward with some excellent examples of how leaders and managers within hospitality can build confidence and resilience. Does anyone reading the book have to follow it step by step or can they jump in and out and pick and choose the sections that they believe are relevant to their businesses right now? That's a great question. So if you think about a Rubik's Cube, there's lots and lots of ways of solving that Rubik's Cube and getting it, getting it right. But you probably have to start from the same start point, um, so you have some sort of routine. So I'd say I think the start point is with a diagnosis because it's a strategy. So in strategy, the, the questions are always the same. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? Or where do we want to be? Where are we now? And how, um, how, how do we get there and how are we doing? So I think as long as you can answer those first two questions first, which is where do we want to be? What's our sense of purpose? What's our new What's our new beginning as a team? And this doesn't matter whether you're leading a department team, a departmental team, or you're leading the whole organisation. The process is the same. So I think start with a good diagnosis of where do you want to be? And then the rest of it is a diagnosis of what, so where are we now against where we want to be? What do I need to do as a leader? What are the leadership bits, tools and, and hints and tips and bits of kit that I need to put in place to create a robust strategy? And once you've got that rolling, it'll run itself. One of the things that um, I picked up, we talked about the transition and you also mentioned how some people are feeling very anxious about coming back, back to work. There's a section in your book called The Game Face, uh, which I read and have shared with a few people because I thought it was so good and we've spoken about it ourselves. Why do you think it's, employer, it's really important for employers, leaders and managers in hospitality to really get to know their employer, employees right now? For the, I mean, for the benefit of the business is an obvious one, but any other reasons? 
Yeah, I didn't realise at the time that I wrote that just how relevant that was going to be. And what I'm seeing in talking to people is that the front line are taking a lot of pressure. The, we didn't really know what was happening with consumer behaviour at the time I wrote it. And I think that consumer behaviour is still evolving. But there are some strange things happening in customers because the customers are also, and clients and, and guests are also a little bit stressed. Um, and, and when we're stressed, we behave weirdly. So I think the front line is picking up quite a lot of pressure and the pressure of putting that game face on and making um, out that everything's OK. And I'm looking after you as my guest or as my customer when I've left, behind, I've left at home my own elderly parents or my own children. It's a, it's a big strain to put that game face on. So we don't really know um, how people have managed through furlough. They might have had times of anxiety, they might have had times of depression. And I think we need to be able to take all that into account and look at the whole person holistically and not just a pair of hands delivering plates or a, a, a body doing a job. And I think that's put a huge demand on leadership that we really didn't have before. Uh, you, you mentioned, place. sorry, you, you mentioned redundancy earlier on. And I think um, one of the things that struck me about the game face was in knowing, if you know your employees and your team members well, and then you have to make those difficult decisions, um, that can help you um, work through that work through that process. Would you agree with that? I do. I, I do agree with that entirely. And I think that before this crisis, you could get by with a fairly superficial relationship. It was it was possible to get by and get the job done with, with fairly superficial levels of relationships. I think now that's changed the necessity to have a deeper level of relationship, the necessity to really deal with people as individuals, to be able to spot problems early either in relationships in on the job or relationships with themselves, which is really what that game face is also saying. Let's look at what's happening for people at a, at a deeper level. So as we can get help, we know that there are mental health problems coming at us down the track as a society. We know that. And I think in hospitality, we, we can we can afford to be more sensitive and we've got great support in, in organisations like Hospitality Action to get support early. We are really lucky as an industry because we're very well resourced. We just need to be able to know where those resources are and when to use them. I, I, in, uh, over the summer, um, the focus on mental health and well-being has become huge. I mean, you just touched on it there. It's going to be so important. And I think part of the, the element in your book about mental health and well-being is going to be is a really supportive one that leaders and managers can get a lot out of. Um, moving on, what do you think success might look like? And can it be measured? So by that, I mean, sort of looking at the sort of six to six month time, 12 months time. I mean, I know there are so many variables, but if you used picking up the pieces, how would you be able to measure how far you'd come? I think the, me the measures and the metrics are kind of hard to get hold of right now because they keep changing. So you might have like financial metrics or, or loyalty matrix or, or um, you know, ratings on TripAdvisor or, or all of those sort of normal metrics in, in business. I think now that some of the softer metrics and measurements are going to be important and they're impossible to measure or difficult to measure, but you can feel them. Things like trust. There have been many organisations that have behaved impeccably through this process and there are organisations that haven't. And I think that the amount of trust, the amount of engagement from your employees and your colleagues, um, the relationships, um, the positivity, resilience, because we are going to have to change the way we do things. This is, as I said, it's not a new normal. We're, we're constantly on the, on the lookout for how we change things. So I think that agility, trust, all of those kind of leadership attributes and, and outcomes of good leadership are maybe not measurable, but they are intangible, but you can feel them, if that makes sense. I, 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 the metrics are the metrics, business, you know, the business metrics. But I think there is a feeling of, and, and pride, pride in what we're doing, pride in what we've done, sharing, celebrating. Um, there has to be some celebration in all of this at some point, otherwise, what was it for? I agree. Two words I've just picked up there, trust and pride. 
And I, I think those are so important, having pride in where you work and having trust in the people that lead you, that yes. they're, going, they're doing the right thing by you, I think is important. Um, Picking up the pieces is, is a, a great standalone document. It's a great book. Um, there are any other tools and tips that you might suggest that uh, team leaders, managers, etc., could have a look at that will sit alongside it, your your ebook? Yes, I think this period of of transition um, and getting back to you know, getting places open again, and it's it's different in different parts of the country, obviously. Um, we really we we have been really well resourced through this time. So starting at the top from you know sort of organ hospitality organisation point of view, UK hospitality has some great material on its website. Um, um, they've been working tire tirelessly. Um, so look at on websites, webinars, things like Institute of Hospitality do great webinars. Caterer.com for for job news and for industry news in general. Um, there's been um, a, a big push with hospitality action. They, they, they're, they're so available. Whether you, if you subscribe to their employee assistance program, then there's all sorts of benefits. And even if your company doesn't subscribe as an individual, there is still a lot of helpful stuff on their website. Lots of helpful information on their website. So I think to 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 look around and to use what's available and to ask questions to ask other people to use your networks. We're all in this together. We're not all in the same boat because some people's boats are shinier and faster than <laughs> yours maybe. But, yeah. um, but yeah, we're all in this together. So I think to ask questions. And another thing that I found is that you know, people who would normally charge for services are giving it away for free because we know that's what we need to do right now. So look around and take advantage of everything that's going because there's a yeah. lot out there. I see the invisible chips over there, just behind you. Um, and it's a fantastic concept. It's such a clever idea. Tell me how picking up the pieces links to invisible chips. Oh, thanks for that. Well, I'm giving the book away for free. The, the e-book is, is free. Um, and um, we'll, we'll talk about how you, how you access that in a minute. Um, if you can swap it for a portion of invisible chips and tell them that it's as a result of picking up the pieces, that'd be really great. That would be great because we're taking something and putting putting it back in, and that's that's kind of good for the universe to put back in when you take. So, a packet of invisible chips is three pounds fifty, um, or or upwards. So, a pack or two of invisible chips would do the job nicely. I think, that I money think... goes to support people who are less fortunate. So that money will go towards people who have been made redundant or are financially challenged during this so during this um, period. So it's all good karma in terms of keeping the industry going. It's a lovely idea. I love the idea that by accessing your book, you are, uh, you know, and donating your £3.50, you're actually helping others less fortunate in the industry. It's such a good way to do things. And it is good karma. I agree. Um, so how can people access your book? Do, do you have a website where you can go and click or download? Um, I haven't put it on the website yet, but I will do. If you just either direct message me or send me um, a message through our website www.merlin-consultancy.com then we'll, we'll pop a copy off if you want to work as a team and you want to have some hard copies i do have some hard copies available um if you want loads of copies i might ask you for a bit of help with the postage because um that's how it is right now but yeah just just contact me let me know hillary it's been an absolute pleasure Sorry, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Before we finally sign off, do you have one final takeaway that um, leaders and managers could use and benefit from as we go forward through the next six to 12 months? Yeah, I think it's going to be a bit more than one, but build a strategy, involve the team so that everyone understands the plan and why you're doing things. But more important than that, is to is to consider your own wellness and look after yourself because this these are tough times um and one of the toughest things on managers and leaders at the moment is that they just don't have the answers and these are people who are used to having the answers and it's really quite painful not to know so that causes stress so i think you know just look after yourselves and and, and be aware of your own wellness that's the thing i would i would leave with 
Thank you so much, Hilary. It's been an absolute joy to talk to you. Um, as you say, if people want to get hold of it, uh, the book, Picking Up the Pieces, they can reach you um, via the Merlin Consultancy um, website or email address. Okay, you have a great day and have a lovely weekend. It's been lovely Thanks to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.